In 1986, in a groundbreaking move, Pope John Paul II invited religious leaders from around the world to join him in Assisi to pray for peace. Now this year, in October 2011, Pope Benedict, to commemorate the 25th anniversary of that Assisi meeting, repeated the event, inviting religious and movement leaders from around the world to also join him in praying for peace. And that is where we begin. The town of Assisi has a vocation of peace and dialogue because of the person in Francis, this concept of the Tao. It's this strong symbol, a dialogue, a back and forth with God. Saints in history are raised up because we need something, and God will not let us suffer in need. So he holds up a city, he holds up a little man, he holds up his friend, a woman, to be ambassadors of peace in this world, ambassadors of reconciliation. The first time that the Pope came here, yes, was 25 years ago, but we lived with the imprint of terror, war, things that had never happened before. Who could imagine that a leader of a country would sequester a whole race of people, a whole group of people, and try to annihilate them? 9-11 is kind of a returning to that impossibility of thinking that way. Who would have thought somebody would do something like that? Put people in an airplane, use it as a weapon to destroy other people. Now there is so much we can talk about when it comes to peace and interfaith relations. And to help me flesh these topics out, I am now joined by Father Damien McPherson. He is the director of the Office of Ecum Ecumenical and Interfaith uh, Affairs for the Archdiocese of Toronto. Next to him is the Reverend Dr. Karen Hamilton. She's the General Secretary of the Canadian Council of Churches. And joining us for this particular show is Rabbi Baruch Friedman Cole. He is the uh, Senior Rabbi at the Beth Tzedek Congregation that's also here in Toronto. Welcome, all of you. Thank you. Maybe I should start because we mentioned one groundbreaking event, and I think it was groundbreaking in terms of let's invite all these people to pray together. But I think you also were part of a groundbreaking event just recently in that you all were part of a, an interfaith pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Can you tell us a little bit about maybe Father Damien, if you can start maybe where that idea came from? Is it the first time you do it? What was the purpose? Yeah, actually we feel that uh, we're the first to do that, certainly in North America. Uh, it's never been uh, known to have been done before. And um, it, it went perhaps even more successful than, than we even anticipated. Uh, with We had about 60 pilgrims. So you had Christians, Muslims, and, and Jews. And Jews, yeah. And, and uh, the experience was enriching, uh, not only for those of us who put it together, but for the pilgrims themselves. We just recently gathered uh, to mm -hmm. hear the stories uh, of, of the others uh, on the pilgrims. And, right. and it was uh, just overwhelming, uh, the degree to which it still is uh, r being recalled and spoken about and... and uh, so when people ask you, well, why, why do you do that? Why bother? What, what, what is your response, Dr. Hamilton? There are three faith traditions who have strong and significant roots in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. We've talked about scripture before as, uh, as we've conversed together, and there are s there's so much that we share in terms of our, our ancestry, our roots mm -hmm. in the faith. We call the trip the path of Abraham, because Abraham, Abraham is, is a constant, yes. is a constant, and uh, and uh, is a constant, constant in our traditions, but is an ancestor for all of us. Mm -hmm. And so, to take a group of Jews, Christians, and Muslims, and it was, it's in this this uh, context, I think, important to say that I w I was there not in my capacity as general secretary, but as a Protestant clergy right. person. So we had Roman Catholics, we had Protestants, we had uh, Jews, we had Muslims traveling together through a part of the world that is held to be extremely sacred and important to all mm -hmm. and that we see so much of what we see through the eyes of our common ancestor Abraham. Right. Now Rabbi Baruch, do you see any objections from maybe let's say members of your congregation or other Jews that you know in terms of doing that kind of work or is it is it is it acceptable among Jews to say yeah absolutely we should be I think there you can't do anything in life without somebody saying I don't agree with that <laughs> <laughs> so True. that would be unrealistic yeah, okay. but I would say okay. the vast majority of our community um, uh, thought that it was a very important a groundbreaking um, mission first of all you need to understand we're talking about three faiths mm -hmm. we're talking about 
going to a land that is sacred to all three faiths. But at the same time, the goal was to also expose people to two people, that is, to the Jews as a nation and to Arabs as a nation, to mm -hmm. Palestinians. And then it's one land. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how do three religions, two people, share one right. land? So we were interested in exposing people to some very intense experiences. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we brought Jews to Jenin, which mm -hmm. is a city that was uh, full of conflict a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we brought uh, Jews to Bethlehem, mm -hmm. um, which is a city that is currently divided. Gotcha. Uh, we came to Hebron, mm -hmm. which is the city of Abraham, mm -hmm. but we have to go into different entrances mm -hmm. to the mosque slash synagogue for our prayers. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we brought Christians and Muslims to Jewish settlements in what wow. is called the West Bank or in Judea. Yep. Um, we wanted people to understand uh, the depth of people's perspectives and opinions. So, for example, the Muslims were housed with everybody else on a, an Orthodox Jewish kibbutz hmm. that was created by Holocaust survivors. Wow. So there's a lot of contradictions actually and conflicts Layers, that we wanted yeah. to build Layers, into yeah. this so that people would understand um, the complexity of life in the Holy Land. Not only historic complexity, yeah. but contemporary. Com the, the situation in the Holy Land is very, <laughs> very specific. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say it's very different than the situation here in Canada. And maybe Canada is not a good example, but I don't know mm -hmm. because you, you're in the business of interfaith and, and ecumenical work. Um, so do you, do you find that while you're there, yes, everybody's uh, fine and we can get along, but then the, 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 how does that continue when you come back? I mean, I don't know how many people were part of this pilgrimage. 60 or 60. So those 60 people, now that they're here, how does that continue, Father Damien? Well, that's one of our hopes, actually, mm -hmm. uh, as we were planning the trip, that, that the experience would enliven these pilgrims to, mm -hmm. to become more conscious, become more aware of their responsibilities, really, to, mm -hmm. to be uh, people who can function in interfaith uh, communities uh, and not, not and if, if if necessary to break down walls of suspicion and um, create a, a much more positive environment. So, so these people presumably they're not the ones that have the fears and the hang-ups uh, uh, but they <laughs> might become yeah. they, I think they had they a lot have, of fears. So what sort of fears yeah. did you I guess were well, expressed? Well um, let me first of all uh, regrettably one of our you know, fellow leaders, uh, Imam Abdul Hai Patel, was able wasn't to. able to be here today. Yes. But we had Muslims who were fearful of going to Israel and going through the border mm -hmm. controls. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. We had Jews who were frightened about going Into to Bethlehem. Janine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, we had um, Christians who were very concerned about what it would mean to be on a Jewish settlement. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there was a lot of anxiety that people had oh. and there was anxiety about um, even simple conversations. Remember we're not just we're not talking about everybody dressed in Western garb. Mm -hmm. there, there are Muslims who are that in, went on the pilgrimage, that went on the yeah, pilgrimage yeah, yeah. and went through all the checkpoints and went really? through all of the border controls that are in full Muslim garb, yeah. okay? Hijab and Interesting. And so um, we were interested as well, how do Jews react to with them? Yeah. And how do yeah. Christians react to them? Yeah. We had people who said, gee, this is the first time I've had a, ver a really serious conversation mm -hmm. with somebody yeah. of, of yeah. another yeah. religious tradition on a very deep level. Yeah. Is and, it? and that's frightening. Uh, yesterday, no, today's Tuesday, Sunday, was the, was the reunion, and I haven't had time to tell my colleagues this, but one of the, the Muslim uh, gentlemen on the trip said to me that they were approached when they were in Yad Vashem mm. because there were, there were uh, Muslims in traditional garb the with, us, yeah. with us and with the, with the niqab and the hijab, and they were approached by people who said, we have never seen a Muslim in this place before. And they said it very civilly, very kindly, but 
it was clear that this was the first time. Now let me ask you this again. I think a lot of those fears make sense going to that place. Do some of those are some of those fears valid here in Canada, mm -hmm. or expressed here maybe differently, but just as well, valid? I think people don't necessarily know how they're going to be received. So mm -hmm. everybody is usually a, on best behavior, and it's it's usually formal, and they don't often um, actually go into somebody else's territory, mm -hmm. by which I mean for a deeper conversation mm -hmm. or for a religious service. Mm -hmm. But here you had um, Christians who were reaffirming their baptism and surrounding them mm -hmm. were Jews who were sort of cheering them on. Yeah. <laughs> and over here <laughs> were Muslims who were involved in their afternoon prayers. Okay. Um, or, uh, for example, um, at the Western Wall on a Friday night, mm -hmm. you have a group of people dancing. Turns out that in that dance group are Jews, Muslims, Christians. Um, there are pious Jews and there are Israeli soldiers and everybody's sort of dancing to mm -hmm. welcome the Sabbath. I assure you, people were not prepared for that. And we're, when we come back to Canada, we bring those experiences mm -hmm. to share back here. Okay. So, so the dialogue is important mm -hmm. and at the, at, a, at the very least people are getting to know each other, they're getting to understand each other and that's maybe where peace begins. Mm -hmm. And they're, see they're seeing particular holy sacred places through each other's eyes. As well, as well. Okay, we're going to take a little break but I do want to continue with this conversation. Uh, we're talking about interfaith relationships and how that can lead us towards peace. So don't go anywhere. When we come back we're going to uh, look at some practical ways uh, that we can adopt an interfaith mindset. So stay tuned. Let us know your perspective. Email us at perspectives at saltandlighttv.org or reach us by mail. Perspectives at Salt and Light Television, 114 Richmond Street East, Toronto, Ontario, M5C1P1 or call us toll free at 1-888-302-7181. Let your perspective be heard. Now with a new pope coming, he saw such value in what happened before. Maybe he's trying to respond to the people that didn't understand and said that we'll gather together in peace, we'll gather together in silence, we will pray, but we will give testimony together anyway that faith is important. People of faith need to have a moment of gathering together to demonstrate that faith just in the same way that some people try to use bombs to demonstrate the lack of faith and to increase fear and to tell us that we should be against one another. We reach out in Christian charity, living it, not just talking about it, living it, doing something, which is what this Pope said. Enough talk, let's do something. So when you do something, you take a risk that it's being misunderstood? Yes, but you do it anyway. Because when you love someone, that translates anyway. One of the things that was very apparent to me in the Assisi gathering, and Rabbi, you said something that made me think about this, was that even though they gathered together and they met, they didn't pray. I mean, they prayed together, but separately. Does that make any sense? Yes. And maybe, yes. Father Damien, you can explain the reasoning. But you mentioned that the, you had a similar experience at the Jordan, where the Christians are, are involved in their ceremony, the Muslims are doing their prayer in this case. So is there, is there, is there a... Is there a way that we can pray together, or is it okay to, pr because of the different traditions, pray separately, b but together? Do you in know what I'm asking? In each other's presence. Yeah, well, they came together, uh, not to pray together, but to pray. Pope John Paul II was criticized. Because they did pray together 25 years ago. No, they didn't. No? But, but actually, I mean, the scuttlebutt is, is that Ratzinger, when he was prefect, mm -hmm said that this is, this is uh, reducing the church to relativism, mm. uh, that, uh, that everybody is the same and it doesn't matter who right. they are. So uh, he, he's very conscious of the fact that, that, that they don't come together to pray together. Uh, and like on that day, uh, I, I had a, we had an interfaith service at, in Toronto just to kind of yes. mimic the uh, CC event. And we didn't, we didn't pray together, but we heard one another's prayers. prayers. Yeah. Uh, so there's value in praying in the, s in the presence of each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
I suppose it's semantics. I could argue that that's praying together, even though we're not. It's not. Well, no, it's not, because you're praying in your own tradition. Okay. You're praying your own in your own tradition. We had a a a, um, a service in the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, obviously that was a Christian service. Yeah. But our Jewish and Muslim colleagues sat in the what you might call the congregation. But we were very particular about our language. This was a Christian service, and people were welcome to observe. Okay that service. Or for example, when we were at uh, the Haram al-Sharif, which is the sacred site in Jerusalem for Muslims, um, the, uh, what, what Jews call the Temple Mount, mm -hmm. uh, Muslims went in to pray. Because you have to be a Muslim to go because in. Because you have to be a Muslim to go in. And Jews and Christians were on the outside. And in fact, Father Damien had a, a, a very moving and interesting experience there as well. Yeah, well, it was just an opportunity to, to uh, bestow a blessing upon uh, the people present there, and uh, it was given and received in the same manner. It was, yeah, it was good, mm -hmm. yeah. And one of the things I, I think I want to highlight at this mm -hmm. point, because it's not known as widely as we might like, mm -hmm. but people know why Jews go to that part of the world. People know why Christians go to that part of the world. But it's very, and I, I said this implicitly, but I want to say it explicitly, there are very many holy sites for our sisters and brothers who are Muslim. Yes. In some cases, the sites are the same sites. Mm -hmm. In some cases, they're not. Mm -hmm. But it's an extremely important, it's the third most holy city for yes. Islam. And, yeah. and so it's important for people to know that. Yeah. And that's why it was important for us to go yeah. and do these things that we did. Yeah. And, and Muslims said, to us that they really felt this created for them an opportunity to go to their sacred sites that they might have been fearful to go to on their own because yeah. of the whole Israeli-Palestinian, yeah. Jewish, yeah. Muslim kind of stuff. Now, uh, it's how would, the, again, uh, how would that translate to the, a reality here in North mm -hmm. America? Does that mean that I'm welcome to your synagogue uh, as a, as a as an observer, can I participate? There are certain parts of a service in which one might say, yes, you may participate, and other parts that, that wouldn't be appropriate. Mm -hmm. But even to give something quite simple, reading Psalms. Mm -hmm. Christians read the Psalms of yeah. Zion, yeah. okay, um, and they understand them in a different way than Jews understand the Psalms mm -hmm. of Zion. Mm -hmm. So even when we're saying the same words, we may be understanding them in different ways. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. One of the most moving experiences for me was in the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem mm -hmm. because our Muslim sisters and brothers revere Jesus. They mm -hmm. consider him to be a prophet. And so we're in the Church of the Nativity. Now that's a Christian site. That is a flat out Christian site. And yet, and yet, and yet, this woman, this Muslim colleague, was in tears in the mm. site. The Christians actually weren't in tears, but, mm -hmm. the, but the Muslim woman was in tears saying, this is the place where Mary bore Jesus, and she knew the story. Interesting. And, yeah. and revered yeah. the place yeah. from that perspective uh, from the Quran. Yeah. I think it might be I important to just, just to say that, uh, and I'm, perhaps this is one of Benedict's motivation for calling the, the Assisi mm -hmm. event, is that you know, if there's no peace among religions, mm. there will be no peace in the right. world. And <laughs> Especially, but okay, so, and, and I wanted to ask you, because this is a good, good segue, uh, Benedict did invite some people who are not part of mm. formal religious, you know, there were some non-believers, there's a, a gentleman, uh, he's a Mexican philosopher, he's one of the four non-religious delegates invited uh, to the event, uh, and he calls himself a humanist, he actually says, we humanists, in dialogue with believers, commit ourselves together with all men and women of goodwill to building a new world in which respect for the dignity of each and every person is the foundation of life in society, which you know, we would so, all agree with that. So this is not someone who is anti-religious. Yes. It's not someone who's anti-belief or anti not, not only uh, who's anti-theistic. This is someone who says, I have a path that I'm on that I hope will lead me to truth. Mm -hmm. And you have a path that you're on that you hope and pray will lead you to truth. Mm -hmm. we, we each want that path. Um, we're on 
different paths, but maybe maybe look at them instead of as completely different, maybe look at them as different lanes on a very big highway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And hopefully we're all going in the same direction. I'm worried about the one guy who's driving the other way. <laughs> would you say, would you, but would you say that the same, mm -hmm. uh, what applies to the interfaith dialogue applies to the dialogue with non-believers as well, even if they are anti-faith? I mean, the dialogue between Muslims, Jews, and Christians, uh, we have a common foundation. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah that's... Yeah. And, uh, so that's a little easier. Yeah, it is it's easier. difficult right, yeah. and challenging, but it's a little easier. Yeah. yeah. But there are things that we, as, as people of faith, can learn from individuals who are non-believers. Mm -hmm. First of all, it challenges us to go beyond yeah. our own individual Bodies. religious tradition and understand what we have in common. Second of That's, all, yeah. it, it reminds us that um, there, there are multiple paths out there, and we, as religious people, sometimes get caught up in our own institutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the challenge of a non-theist or of an agnostic is, well, what do you, where are you beyond your own religious tradition? in that search for the oneness. So Pope Benedict in his address kind of said very, very close to what you're saying. I'm glad Would that you, he agreed with me <laughs> or I agreed with him. <laughs> but, but, but so in, in, the, in the sense that the, the questions that an agnostic might have or someone who is searching for truth outside of a formal religious, mm. organized religion, uh, can purify our own beliefs. Yes. Would you agree yeah. with that? Yes, and definitely. help us articulate our own beliefs as well. Because questioning is good. Yeah, well, that's one of the values of interfaith dialogue. You know, uh, uh, it, it enriches your your the own, your individual faith mm -hmm. as you listen and learn from your partner in dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't enter authentic dialogue if you're not sure of your faith. You know, you don't do any service to dialogue if you if you're a skeptic. You know, uh, uh, but if you're firm in your faith, you can only l enrich it in in, in good in, in good dialogue. How is dialogue affected or different uh, from evangelizing or proselytizing? Yeah, it's uh, uh, see that's that's different. one of the, the difficulties yeah. that uh, it's well, not it so much a difficulty. It's one of the clarifications that has to be, be established yeah. in terms of the that dialogue. There is, that, sorry, that there isn't an objective to evangelize. No, that they're very different dialogue. from each other. Evangelizing. No, the object of dialogue is not conversion. Exactly. No, but conversion may occur along the way. Th but that's. That's out of your control, yes. and that's acceptable. Uh, but we don't uh, gather around the table because uh, we want to make the other what we are. Right, mm -hmm. right. And there's a, a significant difference between evangelizing and proselytizing. Proselytizing is usually defined as something coercive or yeah, manipulative. manipulative. To evangelize is a Greek word. It means to witness to the good news. Right. Well, surely that should be part of daily yeah. life. You're witnessing yeah. to the good news of how you are experiencing God in your life. And in that sense, Rabbi would be evangelizing if he's witnessing to the good news yeah. Yeah. Uh, as well. Sure. Um, how well we while, you're, while you're catching yourself, I, I, let me just say that you know one of the strategic and important things about dialogue is that it, has, it, it doesn't have anything to do about compromise mm. Mm -hmm. at all. Uh, and uh, as I said before, it, 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 one of its main goals is to strengthen your own faith yeah, in terms of Th what you've learned. Uh, that's what I was going to say, actually, mm -hmm. that you'd, f you'd find that having journeyed to the Holy Land together, or even in the relations mm -hmm. that you have here as friends, that you are, just kind of mm -hmm. neat to see that it strengthens you as a Catholic, you Me as a Protestant, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and you as a Jew. Correct. Yeah, and that's So maybe. we're deeper in who we are because we're also able to talk with one another. So in that sense, there is conversion. Mm. If you know what I mean. Well, deeper personal conversion. Yes, yes. yes. exactly. Yeah, yeah, that we're all called nice to that kind of conversion. Anyway, we have to yeah. leave it there. Yeah. Um, but again, there's so much to talk about. But this is a good beginning. The conversation ends here, but it continues on Facebook. Let us know your comments. What do you think about how interfaith dialogue should be carried and how it may or may not lead us to peace? Uh, Facebook.saltandlighttv.org. We've been joined today by Father Damien McPherson. He's a director of the Office of Ecumenical and Interfaith Affairs for the Archdiocese of Toronto, the Reverend Dr. Karen Hamilton. She is the General Secretary of the Canadian Council of Churches, and Rabbi Baruch Friedman Cole. He is the Senior Rabbi of the Beth Sedek Congregation that's also here in Toronto. Thank you, Thank you very much. We should do this again. We should make it a recurring event. Oh, Just have a little uh, weekly theme. Oh, maybe not <laughs> weekly. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Thank you very You're much for having us. Yeah. So that's all for tonight. We'll see you next week.